All right, I guess it's time to uh, make a start. Uh, I can hear me really well. Can the people at the back hear me? Cool, thank you. Uh, g'day, my name's Michael Kozioski. I'm here to talk about the lessons that we've learned uh, through the last, I don't even know how long it's been, maybe four or five years of uh, watching our project grow from this uh, counterculture upstart with very few users and to the point now where we're a pretty successful uh, growing and most importantly self-sustaining project. The community is now at such a size that there's no real danger of uh, basically people choosing our technology and being completely screwed. So we've learned a bunch of difficult lessons along the way, most of them the hard way. We've learned some conventional wisdom that applies brilliantly and some conventional wisdom that is utter nonsense. And so I'm going to hopefully cover most of that stuff. Um, but first of all, who am I? So most of my open source work uh, is the work that I do for Ruby on Rails. I'm a member of what we call the core team uh, in sort of Linux Foundation kind of parlance that's upstream. I take patches from other people, uh, do work of my own, manage the releases, manage the security. That's something that I do, and that's a horrible, thankless job. Never volunteer to be the guy who's in charge of your project security policy unless there's absolutely no other option. Um, like most other people, though, I, I have various other uh, interests, and my GitHub profile has, I don't know, 13 public repositories. Most of them are just forks of other people's things, but I've been playing around with Cassandra lately. I'm in charge of the cross-site scripting security for Rails, and just a whole uh, bunch of sort of small projects. Everything else, though, is a bit of a side issue for uh, this talk, and everything else is tiny compared to the amount of work and amount of uh, sort of user interaction that we get through Rails. I'm also, however, a dad. Uh, she's t uh, three months old today, actually, and so this has meant that my free time has essentially vanished, but that's okay, because I'm self-employed, I can just kind of take the odd day here and there to do rail stuff, but uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for people who are regular and uh, prolific open source contributors and have, you know, more than one child, because with one, I'm just, you know, basically dying. Now, this is kind of an interesting conference for me to be talking at, because, I mean, you know, this isn't my normal kind of scene. Um, my cell phone is one of these. I buy music on it, which is all DRM'd. I buy apps, which are DRM. They're not open source. Uh, this is what my laptop is, one of these nice little Macs. I pay for software on it. I paid for my editor, for God's sake. I mean, that's just outrageous for most of the people in this room. But I think possibly worst of all, I actually have and love a Kindle. Now, I deliberately left it at home in case someone would come and try to smash it in some stand against the lack of software freedom on that thing. But... I still love it, and I'm happy using it, and I'm going to continue doing so. So I kind of view myself as something of a pragmatist as opposed to someone who's doing this for kind of any moral reason. I mean, I'm completely amoral on almost all matters, and open source and software especially. But I did actually use Linux on the desktop for a very long time. The first version was uh, Slackware 3.6 was the first Linux that I installed on my desktop. Uh, Red Hat 6 was the first installation that I did that was exclusively Linux, so no Windows on that same box. Um, I contributed to this piece of software called uh, Lix. It's a latex editor thing. Many, many moons ago, I'm sure that every single line of code that I wrote has been removed because it's in C++ and I'm a bit of an idiot when it comes to that kind of stuff. But even today, most of my clients are deploying exclusively to Linux in production. So we have a lot of uh, Ubuntu servers and a lot of CentOS servers. So while I have a lot of in common with uh, some of the people in the audience in terms of the technology that we use, I maybe come at it from a slightly different approach, I have slightly different goals, and I'm hoping that that will mean that there's some useful information here, and that in the end, uh, at the end of the talk, that there'll be some interesting questions or heckles from uh, the audience. Now, in order to kind of get everyone up to speed on what it is and what we are, I want to give a really, really brief uh, introduction and covering of the history of Rails, and I feel obliged to say that this is a horrifically biased, a horribly biased version of uh, the history of our project. Many people in the audience may disagree with pretty much everything I say, but uh, here we go. So before Ruby on Rails, basically we all built horrible web applications that looked like this. They were nasty, no one liked to use them, they ran on stupid software that no one liked to use, on stupid operating systems using stupid programming languages that no one likes. We used horrific architecture models like this where we had this crazy idea that we'd be able to have configurable workflows that would have pluggable deployment and persistence models that would just slide in access control as some kind of side afterthought, and that would have multiple user interfaces attaching to the same application. And we tended to draw big-ass diagrams like this, saying this is what happens when someone tries to create a new appointment in uh, our calendaring system. Now, 
that wasn't so bad. This is the application, that's the architecture, that's the process that we followed. What was so bad before we came around was all the kind of what we called XML sit-ups or configuration information that you had to provide in order to basically get anything done. So I don't know if this will work. Yep. So this is a struts configuration uh, thing. This was basically what we viewed as the enemy when we were getting started. So in order to say I want to be able to show someone an appointment and I want a URL for that, you put something like that in your path and then you say what the uh, action is that it's going to do. You tell it the form that that action might be manipulating and the scope of that form, whether or not to run validations. And then you say, well, when something's been successful, you go off to the uh, following JSP page. All right, that's great. Maybe one day in the future when you're showing an appointment and the action has been successful, you want to show them a page which doesn't actually show the appointments page. I mean, we could never think of a case like this, but people were really passionate about basically just that kind of uh, level of configurability. Uh, databases, dealing with object relational mappers. That's basically one of the areas where we took the most flack initially. So in the old days, you would say, well, I want to map a class to my database. I have an appointment object, and I want to store it in a table called appointments. All right, so we'll just specify both of those. Then you'd say, well, the ID of my object is a column called ID, and in the class, it's called uh, it's a property called ID, and it comes from the uh, database, so it uses a native generator. And then you'd say, well, I have a title for my appointments. It's a string, and the column is called title. Now, you've got to remember that for a lot of this information, uh, a lot of this information was actually already available to, uh, to the system. You had a database uh, already there. You had an appointments table. It had a title uh, column, it had an ID column, it knew that the title was a varchar or a char or whatever it was, and so we could figure a lot of that stuff out. So after Rails, everyone now builds really, really interesting, fascinating web applications that solve real problems for real people. They look great, they're really easy to use, people are making money on the web again, and naturally we have uh, set the world free by enabling Twitter to have hours and hours of downtime. Uh, <laughs> but but, but they, st they still do run Rails and they're still pretty happy. So. Yeah. So that's what the business changed into, and this is what the configuration and the development experience changed into. All you needed to do was tell us that I have an appointment model and I want to store it in my database and I want to do things with it. I want to find them by the uh, most recent date and all that kind of stuff. You can just say, I have an appointment, it's a subclass of active record base, and we'll figure all the rest of it out for you. We'll pluralize the model name in order to get the table name. We'll look at all of the columns that are in that table and say, well, there's a title one. Well, you probably want a title attribute, and you want to be able to get, set, and uh, update that value. Uh, every, other model, uh, every other column in the database will be able to do that. And similarly, if you want to show uh, an appointment, you'll add a show action to an appointments controller, and then all of, the, uh, all of the rest of it will just kind of magically work. So in that case with struts, where you had an appointments show action, and it was successful, and you wanted to render the appointments show JSP, for us, the configuration looks like this, and it's intentionally left blank. We, don't re we didn't require anyone to specify that kind of information. If you wanted to make the appointments show controller render some completely random other action, go ahead, you can tell it, you just have to pass arguments to the render function. But by default, we tried to make sure that all of the, uh, sort of the default decisions that we were going to make would make sense for the vast majority of people, and we called that uh, convention over configuration. So we still gave you the option to configure those kind of things if you really, really wanted to. But the fact is that nine times out of 10, you don't actually want to specify that information. You're building an application, you've got a database, you're perfectly happy to accept a different naming standard and maybe it grates you slightly the wrong way, but in order to save all of that mapping information, it was worth it to you. So with that sort of history out of the way, I want to cover the, the lessons. Now, when I submitted this talk, I was going to use something like seven lessons learned uh, from a growing project or something, but I had no idea what the lessons would be until sort of Wednesday morning this week. So um, I, don't, I can't even tell you how many lessons we have, but I'm going to cover them one by one. But before I do, I want to give a quick note on the statistical validity of these lessons. Now, anyone who's done any statistics knows that one of the most important things is the sample size, and in this case, it's one. So I'm hoping that the lessons here are going to be really useful to you. I'm hoping that there'll be maybe one thing that you'll come away uh, from this talk and you'll think, that was really cool. In the project that I'm working on now, we'll try to do that. If everything I say uh, conflicts with what you're currently doing and your project is going really well, 
well then that's just great. I mean, I don't want to get into an argument with something, well, that lesson is wrong. If it's not working for you, or if, if the opposite is working for you, then that's awesome. Now, one of the most important lessons that we have, uh, that we've learned, is that users of your software are by far the best people to actually be contributing to your software. I see SourceForge has this, and every now and then I see calls out on Slashdot and similar websites saying, such and such an open source project needs contributors, you should consider jumping in and helping. I think that that's the worst possible way for you to get contributors. The most important thing that we've learned is that the people who send you patches, the people who decide the direction of your project need to actually be using this project, actually writing applications on a daily basis using our code. Otherwise, they'll just wander off in some crazy direction. Everyone knows that open source is about scratching your own itch. But you've got to ask yourself the question, what is it that's itching? What is it that you're actually scratching? What you want your contributions to do is solve problems that your existing users are actually having. You want it to help them. You want them to be saying, I used to have a lot of trouble doing X. With this change, I can now do X much more easily. Or I used to have to do Y, and I don't see why I had to do that. With this change, I no longer do. But if you just get a bunch of developers sort of off the shelf or wandering in off the street thinking, I'll help with this project, we all know what those developers are going to do, because we're all developers, well, we're mostly developers ourselves. We're going to rewrite everything. And we're not just going to rewrite things for the sake, well, we are just going to rewrite things for the sake of it. And we're going to continue endlessly. See that awesome little transition there? I bet your open source thing can't do that. So <laughs> we have, um, there's a real tendency amongst developers, and I'm incredibly guilty of this myself, that if there's, if you're working on something just for the sake of, I want really awesome code, or I want, I want something to be fast or cool, you'll just change things and change this other thing over here and then experiment with this thing. All of those things will actually keep your wheels moving. The project is making progress, but what is the goal that you're moving towards? If your goal is really just, I want to have the nicest code, rather than I want my users to have the best possible experience, I want my app to be the easiest uh, thing in order to use, I want my library to run on every different platform that's available, um, all of that effort, all of those developers that you've managed to get on board are basically wasting the time from the perspective of your project as a whole. They're having fun, you're probably having fun uh, merging their patches, but the reality is, unless they're actually focusing on solving problems that your users really have, uh, that effort's basically wasted. So the model that I like to think of is that you have a large group of users, and some small percentage of those users are going to turn into contributors. Now, again, this is a case where the lesson is possibly more applicable given the software that we write. But in our case, most people who are, who are building web applications with Ruby on Rails are capable of contributing patches to it, figuring out how to improve things, that kind of stuff. If you're building a desktop application intended for graphic designers, this particular model is probably particularly hard for you to do, but that doesn't mean that it's not something you should strive for. You want to, like, not every designer can write C++ code, and that's understandable, but you want developers who do design work to be the people who are writing your uh, C++ code, not just some guy who wants to experiment with the latest cool new threading libraries that have shipped as part of uh, Intel's latest release. So to put this as kind of a mathematical formula, I was a financial mathematics graduate, so I like these things. Uh, the contributors are some R, some percentage, some rate of conversion from your users. Now, in our case, it's pretty hard for us to estimate reliably um, what our number of users is. I mean, we can look at the number of downloads that we get, and we do. But um, we know that our contributors tend to be about 100 different people uh, in any major release. And we've had maybe, I think, 1,400 people across the history of our project. So the lesson that we learned, though, is that as if you watch, there are those cool movies of uh, open source uh, contribution and changes. If you watch the progression of our project, as we gained more users, we gained more contributors. So this kind of formula holds pretty well. And one of, the up, uh, one of the results of it is that in order to get more contributors, you need to get more users. And that means you're going to have to get your hands dirty or whatever it is that you see uh, marketing as. You're going to have to do marketing because you could have the best code in the world, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference if you don't have people using it and if you don't have people who are wanting to help out. Now, one of the most important things, I'm not a, I'm not a marketing expert, I guess I have to uh, preface that. We have this uh, Danish guy who's just a marketing pimp. He's 
awesome at it. He can get people's attention. He can piss people off or not, as required, in order to uh, get people talking. That worked really well for us. I just kind of was along for the ride. But one of the really important things is that you've got to have a vision for your project. You've got to have that elevator pitch or that one line description of what it is that your project does. So we try to make development fun again, basically, was our, uh, our initial vision. We wanted to make sure that all of the just drudgery that people had to do, the configuration, the deployment, et cetera, just kind of was gone. Didn't have to worry about big build scripts, big compile times. Everything just kind of worked out of the box. You didn't have to choose a unit testing framework. You didn't have to choose a database uh, object relational mapping framework. Everything just kind of worked out of the box and was straightforward. And alongside that, you need a message, something which you're focusing on communicating to the outside world. So your project has to have a vision. This is where we're going. And you need to be able to communicate that vision to the potential uh, users that uh, you're trying to attract. If you get both of those things right and you focus on them, I'm pretty sure that everything else just kind of falls out the other side. That's not to say that just because you have a vision or a message that your project will necessarily be successful, but if your vision and your message is something that resonates with people and you focus on it and you don't just go off and do whatever it is that uh, you want to do as a programmer, slowly but surely your project will gain some uh, users. So one of the one of the big lessons that we kind of learned is there's this folklore in open source uh, from the, I think it's the Cathedral and the Bazaar, right, where you're told you shall release early and often and everything else shall just work. That's, okay. That's actually not entirely true. Now, this, this is maybe overstating. It is kind of true. Releasing early and often is incredibly important if you want to keep the momentum going for the, uh, for the project that you have. If your users have to wait sort of four or five years between different releases, they're just not really going to care. They're going to start experimenting with other things. So you want to release often enough that everything's still visibly moving forward. And this is something that um, projects struggle with as they get large, and it's something that we struggle with uh, today especially. And you want to release early enough that when people look at it, they can see hey, check it out, there's a whole bunch of work to do, I can get involved, I can help out, we can be really passionate about this. But you don't want to release so early that your application or your framework or whatever is basically useless because you only have one chance to make that first impression. As I said earlier, you want your users to be your contributors, so you need to get your users in the first place. And if all they can do is say, well, I've downloaded this tarball. It doesn't actually build. It's going to build one day, but you know, the guy wants some patches to make, give it a user interface. No one's going to look at that and go, I'm really passionate about making this guy's software build. I'm really passionate about making this guy's web framework actually be able to talk to the database and receive HTTP requests. No one's interested in helping you out with that stuff. They're interested in pushing the boundaries of what you've got, but no one's going to help you do that initial base work just because you've uploaded it onto the internet. Whether you're using GitHub or Google code, it doesn't matter unless there's some working small uh, piece of functionality. I don't think you'll attract any users and I don't think you'll attract any developers. So really, what the folklore and the wisdom of our community should be, the community should be, is you want to release early, but not so early that it's worthless, and often, but not so often that you piss people off by making them upgrade every sort of six months. So. One of the difficult things for us as the project has grown and picked up more and more users is actually managing that release process. And we're still kind of shit at it. And I think most people are. If you've never run an open source project, releasing seems really easy. You just do like rake release or whatever, and you tag something in Git and push out the gems, and then everything's done. But the reality is that it's incredibly hard to pick the balance between how many new features do we want to add in this release in order for it to be useful for uh, people to upgrade, versus how many uh, bugs do we want to fix? You know, how critical are these things? Where's that balancing point? Which new features can we introduce without the risk of introducing regression bugs? It's not as black and white as people would like to tell you. It's a really difficult balancing act. And some of the initial feedback that we got in sort of the pre-1.0 days was, oh, Rails is changing too fast. I can't keep up. It's worthless. But that wasn't too much of a problem for us. The community was relatively small at that stage. Most people who had applications were really keen on you know, keeping up with the cutting edge. Once we sort of got to lots and lots of users, like a very large percentage of what we have today, though, most people who are running Rails applications don't actually want to spend their time 
upgrading from one release to another unless there's a really, really good reason for it. It's a very, very difficult uh, thing. It's a very, very difficult balance to get right. You want to fix bugs, you want to add new features, but if you do it too often, your users are going to complain. One of the biggest tips, though, is your users are going to complain about every release that you do. It's just kind of an unavoidable thing. If you take too long, there'll be people who are saying, why did you take too long? You shouldn't have added this new feature. And even if you take that exact amount of time, there'll be people on the other side saying, why didn't you add this feature or that feature? You should have waited in order to make the uh, upgrade worth my while. So don't lose too much sleep over um, getting the release process exactly right, but do try to work that balance between I want to release something initially that is useful and people can get excited about, and I want to release often enough that I keep up momentum but don't drive away our users, uh, don't drive away users. The most important thing that uh, I learned from Joel Spolsky was you need to listen to your users or your customers. Users are currently, they're on board, they're down with your vision, they like what it is that you're doing, they like the direction that you've spoken about, and they're going to make suggestions, have problems, request enhancements, which are consistent with that kind of vision. They're going to say things like, it would be really cool if some idea, or it's a bit annoying how some minor problem that they're having. That's the kind of vocabulary that your users will be using when they're speaking with you. Unfortunately, once you've got uh, anything, any kind of public process, what you'll see is people saying things like this. I'll never use your software until. And then they'll have some reason, be it, oh, it needs to be more modular, it needs to support tail call optimizations, oh, it's not internationalizable, so it's worthless, it needs to support a real database like PostgreSQL, needs to support the enterprise. Until you add these features, I'm not going to come near you, or you're too immature, you guys swear a lot, so no one is ever going to use your software, and I'm certainly not. It, it's very tempting when you start hearing these people saying, oh, here's a reason why I'm not going to use your software. Fix it for me, and I will. The reality is, though, that they are lying. It's a trap. What these people really mean is I will never use your software. They have no interest in jumping on board. They don't agree with your vision. All they're there for is basically to be a pain in your ass. They're saying, well, one day when you support a real database, or one day when you support Oracle, I'll jump on board. And we saw this a lot uh, in the early stages of our development. So people are like, well, I'd use Rails in a heartbeat if it supported SOAP web services. Well, we shipped a release, which did. And those same people just kind of shut up and wandered away. They didn't come in. They didn't start using. And so we'd ship this functionality for them, SOAP web services, which no one in the existing user community was really interested in. We added Oracle support in a release that essentially had very few users, one very passionate maintainer, thankfully. Otherwise, it would have just slipped into disuse and fallen out of the release process. But we added Oracle support, and all the people who had been saying, you know what, when you can run on Oracle, I'm there. I'm going to come. I'm going to help. I'm going to market it to all my users. We're going to build the next billion-dollar idea on top of Rails. And the reality is they were just lying. These people... And you'll find them everywhere, and there are probably people in this room who are thinking that about some project right now. It's like, this looks really cool, but I don't actually want to use it. So I need to find the first possible excuse. And it's really common amongst programmers, because we've all done kind of mathematical proofs, where you go through the steps one by one, and then the first mistake, worthless. You don't have to think about the thing anymore, because it's completely wrong. And these people will evaluate your software along those same kind of uh, axes. They're going to go through it, they're going to find, aha, doesn't support Oracle, can't use it, fine. I don't have to justify it. I don't have to think about this thing anymore. Don't get caught up. Don't try to solve people who uh, aren't your user base. Don't try to do what it is that they want. Or you just ship functionality, and we've done it two or three times, where we regret it afterwards because it adds maintenance burden. New users will come along and say, well, I want to use this thing, maybe. Should I be using the internationalization? Should I be using Oracle support? And the net result is confusing to your users, maintenance burden for you, and those dickheads who nagged you at the start, well, they're not going to jump on the board anyway. One of the really, really common things for us, because we kind of made a bit of a stir when we first came out, is we'll get people posting comments on our blog posts or their own blog posts like this. And this, this, is, this is real. I copied this off a GitHub comment from one of our legendary troll threads, which is, this is the very reason I don't use Rails. And I know there are many other people who think like me. So he said up front, he doesn't use our stuff. He then goes on, I couldn't fit the whole thing on saying, he then goes on to say, and I'll never use it until you do the following different things, like I said. But then the bizarre thing is that these kind of people will say, and here are 10 things that you, I think you should be doing. And 
I couldn't care less what this guy thinks we should be doing because he's one of the folks who really has no intention of using our, pro uh, of using our project. He's got no interest in helping. He's got, he doesn't buy into the vision. He doesn't buy into the roadmap or whatever you want it to call it. He's not part of the community, but he's still going to come in and sort of stick his oar in. So keep an eye out for those people. That's not to say that people who are on the outside and wanting to come in should uh, be excluded. That's not a cool development model. But you need to be really, really careful because the list of people who give you an excuse like that is endless, and satisfying them is a loser's job. You'll never get there. One of the other things when you're considering your user base is that users are going to leave. Just think about it from your own perspective. You were previously using something, and you switched to your own product. It's just kind of the way things go. So back in the very early days of Rails, we were popular because we were anti-establishment. We weren't Java. We were the rebels fighting the sort of evil empire. And we attracted a whole bunch of developers and a whole bunch of users who were really, really regular contributors. They were building cool things off to the side, building cool plugins, additional gems that you could use as part of your uh, Rails application. But as we grew, as we became more successful, suddenly we were no longer that cool counterculture fighting the evil empire kind of project. We were the evil empire for a lot of these people. We, had, we were at the stage that in order to seriously reject us, you had to have a seriously good reason when you're having those conversations. Like Initially, we didn't even come up when some team of developers was deciding what web framework to use for their, uh, web uh, for their new application. Once we got to the point that we came up in every conversation and it was a reasonable point of discussion whether or not you'd choose to go with us, all of those guys who jumped on board because we were counterculture, unique, original, they left. And when it first started happening, I was thinking, my god, this guy's going away. I mean, he's been shipping all of this cool code. He's been adding these new functionalities. He's you know, a bit of a pain in the ass, but he's got some really, really good ideas. And he's just gone. And I kind of stressed out about it and stressed out about it and stressed out about it. But it's just kind of a natural process of any community. People come, people go. Don't lose too much sleep over it. Another lesson that we learned, and we learned this one the really hard way, is that you have to listen to your contributors slightly more than you listen to your users. Because as your project grows, you'll have what we describe as the patches, the patches problem. So in the early days, you've got a ton of work to do, and you've got some amount of volunteer hours, which is going to either be able to achieve that work or it's not. Slowly, as you, as you attract more volunteers and you attract more users, you're going to get more work to do. But the number of volunteers is ideally going to grow at a slightly faster rate. And eventually, you're going to reach this cool stage of equilibrium. And this was us about 1.0, 1, 1, uh, 1.2, that kind of time frame where whenever someone had a cool idea about what it is that we needed to do, there were people around to help build it, test it, document it, all that kind of stuff. The problem is that your user base won't stop growing at that point. And in fact, you'll find yourself eventually at the point where you have so many volunteers, but not actually that much work for them to do, and not enough bandwidth for you to be able to contribute and manage and corral them to be working on the right stuff. And then if you really neglect it like we did, you'll find yourself in a situation where you've got so many people who are so eager in order to contribute to your project. And all you're thinking about is, what's the next piece of application framework code that we need to ship as a part of our next release? So there's this tiny amount of work that's left to do, because it's just really enhancements, new features. And there's hundreds and hundreds of people that are willing to do it. And this is incredibly dangerous. So what did we do? Well, we neglected patches. And this is a genuine uh, screenshot of our patch queue. Now, I'm cheating a little bit here because um, we don't use track anymore, but the track instance is still running so people can see historical bugs. But you can see this is the list of stale tickets, tickets that haven't been touched in ages. We had about 1,500 would be probably a rough number. And some of those were bug reports, but the bulk of them were actually patches. So someone had gone to the effort of saying, I want to add the following feature. They figured out how they're going to have to do it. They figured out how to write regression tests for it. They wrote a little bit of documentation, though most people don't bother writing documentation for new features. Bit of a shame, but that's just the reality. They'd gone to all that trouble. They then uploaded it onto Track, as we'd instructed them. They wrote a nice description of what the problem was they were trying to solve, how they went about it, other ideas that they'd experimented with. And then they uploaded it, and then they waited for a response. But little did they know, they were actually one of 1,500 other people that had gone through that same process. My inbox had become just 
a wasteland. I wasn't able to keep up with it, so I was just archiving emails from track. I didn't care what they had to say. I'd look at the report, I'd figure out what was important. What this led to was incredibly furious contributors, like not just mildly angry, but really, really angry, and rightly so. We had, uh, for the first RailsConf that we did in Portland, we had a contest where people who had, like the tw I think it was 12 or 10 people who had contributed the most in the previous six months, using some metric for most, which was patches, uh, documentation changes, tickets closed, that kind of thing. But, so those 10 or 12 most valuable people outside of the committing team, because they would be cheating, would get a free ticket, they had their accommodation paid for, and they might have even had their flights paid for, which for a lot of these guys was a pretty big deal. By the time the conference actually came around, though, about a quarter of them hated us. They were like, oh, I've given you all these cool ideas, and I don't even hear back from you. So what that led to was they were like, oh, I'm going to fork your thing. I'm going to run my own thing. And that never actually came about. You know, releasing and maintaining a big piece of software like ours is quite a, quite a piece of work. And most people don't actually have the uh, wherewithal to do it. But what we did get was MERB, which is a framework which you know, had its own sort of bent on things. It was pretty similar, though. And the reality was, even if you talk with the people who were regular contributors to MERB, the main reason that they were contributing, the main reason they were passionate, was because of how we had messed up our process for contributing and expanding the uh, Rails code base. So all I can really stress to you is don't do what we did. So don't just say, well, look at all these people submitting patches. What do I care if one or two or three of the 1,500 is really angry with me? Because you know, there's plenty more where you came from. The reality is they'll just continue to get angrier. The problem will just get worse and worse. And it, it requires focused effort in keeping your patches, your contributors, your bug lists um, up to date. Now, one of the sort of lucky breaks that we've had in the last uh, probably year now is that a sort of community, I believe they're even a tax-exempt charitable foundation in the US has sprung up of people who aren't necessarily the world's greatest Ruby programmers, but they're really passionate about making sure that all of the community stuff that we were terrible at runs really well. So they run regular, um, what they call a bug match, which is similar to, I think Mozilla does bug days and GNOME does as well, where you basically just look at this huge pile of things that are in your bug tracker, go through and find the difficulties, find the things which, no, find patches which no longer apply, review patches, suggest that they might be, oh, look, we can't accept patches without documentation, just basically gardening uh, the bug list. And the, the difference has been notable. People are really quite a bit happier contributing code to us now. Uh, I mean, it's still, it's still not a great experience, and you know, we'll never get back that initial head rush of the um, early days where anyone who uploaded something would get an in-person reply within sort of 10 minutes, and it would be committed and would be shipped as part of a release, which at the latest was going to be next Friday. We'll never get that back just because of the size of the project in the community. But we've got it to the point now that I think we have kind of equilibrium. We've got enough people submitting patches, enough people willing to help those people submitting patches, that we can keep on top of this, kind of. So really, really focus on that. Don't just let your contributors go because there's so many of them you're not worried. And the other thing, similar to how your users are going to wander off, is that your contributors are going to wander off, and mostly for the same reason. So we had a, um, we had a pretty, I won't name anyone because there are people who would recognize them in the audience, but we had a few people who were uh, really, really good. They wrote interesting blog posts. They played around with new ideas uh, about where to extend the framework. Uh, they wrote patches. They might have even written a book. I couldn't tell you. They were, they were keen. But about 18 months, a year, uh, two years ago, they stopped all of that, and they just started playing around with new things. And I met them at a conference, and I said, you know, what's the deal here? You used to do all this work for us, now you're working with these other weird alternative frameworks. And he just said, well, you know, I wanted to try something new. I you know, knew how your stuff worked. I had done it for the last three or four years. I like solving new problems, meeting new people, and I wasn't going to be able to do that there anymore. And that, that's just fine. I mean, that's just the reality of any community. People come, people go, people move, take new jobs. Don't freak out about it, but of course, keep an eye on it. One of the, um, one of the things which genuinely is folk wisdom and is 100% correct is that you need to ignore the trolls. There are tons of them out there, and they're just going to descend from the internet and uh, make your life a little bit miserable. And I'm not just talking about these guys, you know, the ones who are commenting on your blog post saying blah, 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 doesn't even work on Windows or whatever, and everyone knows to ignore those guys. But these guys are trolls as well. 
Like, I don't know if you've ever seen comments on Reddit or Hacker News. These people are well-meaning, they're very passionate, but the really, 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 really regular ones, the guys who get lots of karma and get voted up, actually don't use your software. They're, just, they're basically the pundit class of the internet. They haven't done anything in quite a long time. Most of them are master's students and possibly have been that for four or five years. And they're very, very opinionated about how your, um, one, of, one of my favorites was, he said that any programming language which isn't entirely provable is completely worthless. And it's like, that's great, okay? I can understand how you might think that if you're working on mathematical algorithms or security stuff. But you know, any program which accepts input from users is inherently unprovable. So I mean, this guy was just living in a dream world. Don't lose too much sleep over people who sound reasonable but are actually ridiculous, ridiculous trolls. So think about it, I guess, from the point of view as if you were a politician and some guy who has a talkback show, I mean, here we've got this jackass who's a mayor of a small town up north and thinks, he's a, uh, thinks it's a city, and he'll comment on everything. Every, every topic out there, he'll try to get in the news. If you were a politician and you were actually listening to what this guy said and you're thinking, oh my God, Mr. Laws thinks X, Mr. Laws thinks Y, I should change the way I'm doing things. You just spin round and round in circles and eventually burn out. And it's the same with the Reddits, the Y Combinators, the uh, slash dots of the world. There's kernels of good ideas in almost all of these discussion forums. Just don't be obsessed about them. Don't worry if there are people who are, you post a release announcement, they're going, oh, it's shit because it doesn't do this. Or I tried to use Rails four and a half years ago and it couldn't do X, therefore I've never looked at it again and you're all assholes. They're going to say that kind of stuff and, you know, leave them to it. Also, ignore your competitors is the biggest example, uh, is the biggest piece of advice that um, I like to give out. Because you shouldn't ignore them entirely, of course, but you should mostly ignore most of the things that they have to say. Because just because you're competing with someone, like just because you're a web development framework, doesn't mean you have the same vision of a web development framework that we had. You maybe have a slightly different bench, you want to make something that's super scalable, or you want to make something that's uh, super enterprise and supports pluggable this and that. If you look at what your competitors are doing, you'll start picking up features that are just outside your core competency, just outside the vision that you have for that project. And as you keep going up down that path, you keep adding little features, eventually it's not going to be recognizable. People are, people are going to sit down and say, hang on, why again am I using this software? I thought I was here to make development fun again, and you've added all of this stuff about persistent workflows and configurable distribution, blah, blah, blah. So, have a look at your competitors, see what kind of interesting stuff they're doing, what kind of cool ideas they have, but focus on what your users are actually asking for, not what the internet punditry or the, your competitors are actually doing. <coughs> One of the stories that I like to tell, and unfortunately I've lost a screenshot that proves it, is that um, in our early days there were 27 Python frameworks which identified themselves as Rails-like or rails clone. Like that was how they defined themselves. We are a Python web framework like Rails, but blah, 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 blah. We ignored them utterly, didn't care what they were doing. They'd already lost. They defined themselves in terms of what we were, and so they were basically stuck five steps behind us and they were never going to catch up. Now, the one framework which didn't do that, which came out of Python, was Django. They had a different view on how things were going to work. They were like, this is what we want to do. Here's the problems that we were solving. We were building awesome newspaper sites and we had to do it quickly. Uh, automatically generated admin interfaces made that really possible. We like the fact that we've got these inherited templates. You know, they had their own ideas. And if you look at the Python web framework uh, landscape now, I mean, I don't do it regularly because I mostly ignore my competitors, but they've done really, really well. Because the reality is, if you're just Rails but in Perl, eventually people are going to realize, well, learning a new programming language is actually really not that hard, and instead of getting some bastardized copy of Rails, which is lagging two months behind in features, I'll get the real thing. But in Django's case, they, tried, they, they set out their own vision. They set out their own uh, marketing, uh, their, their own position, their own uh, mission statement, I guess is the easiest way to put it. And they executed on that, and they executed really well. I mean, we're still way better than them, you understand, but they are, um, they're pretty impressive, and I respect those guys a lot. This next one's going to piss someone off. One of the best things that we did was we had a really permissive license. We used the uh, MIT license, which is essentially the do-whatever-you-want license. Just don't blame us or claim you invented it. And as an aside, one of the things that I've found fascinating over the last two years is that our license almost says to the word, do whatever you want with it, just don't remove these, uh, just don't remove this license text. The number of people who 
remove that license text. Like the one thing you're not allowed to do is just, it's just enormous. There's hundreds of people out there who just copy and paste and go, oh yeah, whatever, I invented this, change the copyright statement. Now, the reason that I'm so comfortable saying you should use a permissive license rather than a GPL thing is that no one wants to maintain a fork of your software. No one wants to do it. It's a lot of work. Obviously, there are some exceptions to this. If you're Samba or Linux or mPlayer or something where someone could take your software, add a few minor little bits of features, and then stick it in a box that they're going to sell on someone's, uh, to go on someone's TV, the GPL is a great choice in that situation because you know, you'll get those contributions back. But in our case, there's not a company in the world that's going to want to fork Rails and then try to keep up with our stuff, add their own things, and sell some kind of cut-down enterprise, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. So really think about this one. Is your goal to get a lot of really interesting users and maintain some sort of forward momentum, or is your goal to uh, push forward the cause of software freedom? Both of those are very, very valid goals, but your license choice is going to be driven by which side of that uh, sort of line you come down on, and don't just go to one or the other because that's what you, uh, what you think. And one of the other benefits of us having a permissive license is that we get these kind of cool things. So this, these, are graphics, uh, these are graphs from New Relic, which is a commercial hosted monitoring system for Rails. So it's completely tied into your um, application. It knows which models you were looking for and what methods you were calling. It can see how much time we spent in various database queries. It can graph that over time. We can see the throughput from a given database, you know, destroy, find, save. You can see that in this particular case, our uh, application is almost completely uh, read-only. We're not deleting anything or writing anything. We also have pretty neat uh, applications like Hoptoad, which is hosted exception uh, monitoring and notifications. So if you have an error in your application. I know that there are open source tools to do this, but Hoptoad makes it really easy for you to invite other people and you get emails and you can see the list of open exceptions. You can view the, uh, you can view the particular exception that happened, see that it's unresolved, see how many times something that looks the same has come up. So they'll look at the exception class and the line of code that it happened on. I think for us, this was a big part of the reason that people were, uh, became comfortable using Rails is because they were like, well, there's an ecosystem that's building up around this. And the permissive license just made that easier. Obviously, you can build uh, an ecosystem around GPL software. MySQL did that for a while. I don't know how that's working out for them now, but you know, they, they did that. They had people contributing patches. I just think it's harder, and I'm here to kind of annoy people as one of my goals. Um, so that's all I really wanted to cover. Uh, I have left almost no time for questions, so I'm wondering if it's probably easier to take one or two if they exist and then just do the rest. So three minutes, all right. Right, and, and that's definitely true. Repeat that. Repeat that. Sorry, I forgot that there's a web thing. Um, there's definitely people who will say, I can't use your software because it doesn't do X, as I described before. There's two different classes of people there, though. There's potential users and potential contributors. Potential contributors will look at that and say, well, I could make it do X and solve that problem, and therefore I get to use that software. And I guess the reason that I didn't bother distinguishing between them is because most of the time that's actually how they'll introduce themselves to the project. That's actually how I got started with Rails is it didn't do any locking. You couldn't lock a record in the database and that's kind of worthless for some class of the problem that I was solving at the time. And so my initial contribution was here's how locking works. If all I did was write a blog post going no locking, useless, goodbye. You know, it's that famous commander, whatever his name is, slash dot dude with his no wireless, less space than a nomad lame. Most people will write blog posts that are like that. I don't know how to distinguish uh, a potential contributor from that up front, but there's definitely something. Um, more an observation sort of than a question, but being involved in Rails for the last couple of years, um, I think something I've noticed is that you know it's, it's an amazing community with, with even excluding the core team, like you just look at the gems, hundreds and hundreds of contributors, um, and everyone seems to be you know re releasing their things as open source, 
but yet I think a lot of those developers are actually coming from more proprietary backgrounds, and mm -hmm. I don't think they see themselves as open source developers. No, no, they don't. And I, yeah. I, fundamentally, I don't see myself as an open source developer either. I mean, why, I'm, but why, why do you think that is? Because, I mean, everyone's releasing code under open source licenses, they're sharing it, they're reusing it, but they don't see themselves as part of the open source community. What do you think the difference is that... I, I mean, think it's that difference about what is it that you're actually trying to, what's the primary driver of what it is that you're trying to do. I work on Rails and other related open source projects because I want to work with the best tools that I could possibly have. In the cases where I need to pay for those tools, like for Keynote, I'm happy to do that. If your primary goal is to work on cool open source software, you look at that maybe slightly differently. And so I think it's definitely true that most of the Rails community, like the MIT license is every, essentially everything. I mean, there are people who use other licenses, but the vast majority is the really permissive ones. And I think it's just because they view themselves as, hey, here's this cool thing. I'll share it with the community. But that's an afterthought to the fact that they actually just wanted to build that cool thing. I don't know. Yeah, with that previous question about uh, people who say, I'll never use it until mm -hmm. whatever, the sort of stereotypical way to distinguish potential contributors from those who won't is to answer with a really enthusiastic, I'm looking forward to your patch. Please, <laughs> do contribute that. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the patch submission address. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we, we did that for a long time. We picked up, uh, David's a native Danish speaker, so his English is a bit weird in places, but he used to say, please do investigate adding that to Rails, to whenever someone would have a rant like that on a mailing list. And you're right, nine times out of ten, they just go, oh, all right, I better leave then. But the other 10% of, of the time, they show up and they have a patch, and it's great. Uh, how do you deal with that nicely with the reverse problem, which is basically contributors who insist on trying to fix a problem that doesn't actually exist? Uh, <laughs> well, is we there have a nice um, way of dropping them? <laughs> we, I'm not going to say that we have the best way of doing this, but one of the... One of the sort of things that we have is a very vibrant uh, plugin and extension community. So the easiest, that's nice, go away response that we can give is, why don't you try it out as a plugin? And if people are really passionate about it and it picks up momentum, we'll pull it in. And we use that on our own uh, changes that we're experimenting with as well. And it works quite well because if it's a really dumb idea and you don't want to hurt their feelings and say, that's, that's stupid, you just say, well, let's see what happens when you pick up some users and then we can you know, battle test it, figure it out, and put a proper solution to the core of Rails, they'll just disappear because no one will use these things and they'll be like, oh, well, no one wants it, so there must be another nicer solution. And in the w rare cases where the idea that you thought was dumb actually turns out to be this awesome revolutionary change, you can pull that in as well. I think um, we've got lunch coming up. Okay. Um, we're not going to close the place, so if anybody wants to carry on talking to Michael, that's great. Um, you can do that here. Um, but uh, here's the gift from the don't drink it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Michael. Yes, sir.